Ready for a game of pool? You're right on cue today on Wickwire. Hi, I'm Jared Seaman, Assistant Director of the 1890 House Museum, the home of the Wickwires. In these special videos, we'll take you up close, in depth, and behind the scenes at this 19th century mansion. The centerpiece of our billiard room is this mahogany billiard table produced by the Babcock Billiard Company in Syracuse, New York. In 1890, this model cost $450, about $12,500 today. Now, billiard tables were seen as pieces of furniture as much as they were seen as gaming tables during this period. Some billiard tables even doubled as dining room tables. But buying the table wasn't enough for a proper billiard room. You also needed the accessories to go with it, kind of like smartphones today. The accessories included this ball rack, this wall rack, and this scoring system for snooker. In this original photo, taken by Chester Wickwire in 1890, you can see the pool table and all of the accessories. Can you spot the donkey in this photo? Grown-ups didn't have all the fun. Young Charles and Frederick also played games here, like pin the tail on the donkey. But the billiard room wasn't just for play. It was also for business. Chester invited his business friends for nights of pool and drinking. He would have served them out of a monogrammed wine bottle, like this one. Chester sealed the deal over a cigar or two. He stored them in this humidor. In the summer of 1892, this room played host to the most brilliant party of the season, as the local newspaper called it. The Wickwires invited 350 guests from as far away as Virginia. The guests arrived at 9 p.m., and Chester's wife Ardell welcomed them into the gold parlor downstairs. One guest was Mabel Fitzgerald, the girl next door, who 13-year-old Charles Wickwire had a crush on. Mabel caught Charles's eye in her yellow dress, which had a blackbird design sewn into the sign. And as midnight chimed, the older guests began to leave, but Charles and his friends wanted to keep partying. There was just one problem, though. The city of Cortland turned off the streetlights at midnight sharp. Chester called the electric company, and he asked them to keep the lights on until 3 a.m. And since Chester was such an influential man in town, the electric company agreed. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Wickwire. Be sure to like and subscribe, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The links are in the description below.